Welcome to the Leader's Pause, where leaders like you tune in to find calm, get clear, and level up. Tune in with best-selling author, speaker, and coach Hal Runkel as he helps you take back your time, your energy, and your decision-making power. All you have to do is learn to press your own pause button first. So take a break, take a breath, take a knee, and learn to access your greatest human superpower, the ability to pause, think, and decide for yourself. It's time to find calm, get clear, and level up. The Leader's Pause starts now. Good afternoon, good evening. This is The Leader's Pause. I'm your host, Hal Runkel. And as we always do, start off with a question. Question is, how do you like to handle conflict? Now, I've worded that question very specifically. Because the reality is most people do not like to handle conflict at all. So the idea of asking how would you how do you like to handle it is indicative. Because if you actually, you know, what are forced to think about, well, if I have to deal with it, how would I deal with it? That's reality. Because Conflict is everywhere. It is all around us, surrounding us, underneath us. It is in every relationship. It's in every deal. It is in every transaction. Conflict is everywhere. And yet, the vast majority of us would rather avoid it. Hope it doesn't happen. Find a way to escape from it. Now, there are some folks that thrive on it, love it, welcome it. Those folks uh, tend to have financial success a lot of times. Um, they will have some professional success. They struggle in, in personal relationships a lot. The reality is conflict is uh, one of the, one of life's greatest uh, growth vehicles. And when we learn to recognize it and have the courage to unearth it and face it, then we have to learn how. But the first step is recognizing that it's everywhere and, and recognizing that, look, here's a, here's a good test about conflict. Think about every great leap of personal growth you have ever had. Great leaps. Not the slow, slow, gradual ones that seem to evolve. We're talking about the ones that are revolutionary, the revolve, the the. The great leaps always came after a period of really difficult discomfort and some form of conflict. Conflict with how you wanted to do things and how you needed to do things. Conflict between how uh, you saw it and how someone else saw it. Conflict between uh, uh, what you wanted and what you didn't want. And finding a way to have the courage to pursue the thing you did want, even though it meant you were going to face resistance from other people, from those closest to you, resistance from the surrounding environment, from the establishment, from the systems you belong to. Conflict, in a word, works. It works. It is the only way actually things grow, is through resistance, is through difficulty, through struggle, through challenge, through disagreement. It's the only way that new ideas ever happen. You think that every growth we always say we want is on the other side of some form of conflict, and yet we are afraid of it because it is uncomfortable, and we just hope and pray that it just somehow gets better. That's what we, that's what we would prefer we want the benefits of conflict. It's kind of like me and writing. People ask me, do I, do I like writing? Because I've had three books and had a blog for years and years and years. Do I like writing? I'm like, well, no, not always. But I love having written. I, that's not an original line to me. That's been said by a lot of authors. But the reality is that when you finish a project, you are so thrilled that you did it. But going through it, it's kind of like exercise in many ways. And that's a good that's even a better analogy because exercise is literally facing resistance, whether it's the, the resistance of going an extra few minutes or miles or the literal resistance of a weight that you are pressing away from you or pulling towards you. That is resistance. And do you think about it? It's the only way you ever grow muscle. 
either your heart muscle through cardio or your uh, or your uh, body muscles uh, through resistance training. It is the only way. It is through conflict. It is how growth happens. So when we are brave enough to embrace the reality of conflict and the fact that it is a vehicle to growth, it is, think about it, it's the only way you ever actually had a good relationship is going through conflict and resolving it on the other end. It's the only way. You had a disagreement, you talked it out, you learned to respect one another, you actually somehow change, sometimes changed your mind based on the input from another person, you both changed your minds based on the input from another person and came up with a new idea altogether, you never would have come up with had you not had open conflict. So what we're going to talk about are the seven deadly sins of conflict management. These are the we, the things to avoid. And when we're deciding to embrace conflict, these are the things that will get us in trouble. These are the things that actually keep conflict having a negative name, having a bad connotation. These are the things that keep giving us uh, frights about facing difficult conversations, difficult disagreements, is these seven deadly sins. And... And if we're aware of them, then that can give us a leg up on on how to recognize when we're veering away from the path that I believe conflict calls us towards, which is straight and narrow. But it always leads to growth. So, seven deadly sins. Number one. The number one deadly sin of conflict management is what we've already talked about, avoiding it. Avoiding it is the ultimate passive aggression. Is I've got a disagreement with somebody, or there's a disagreement with people on my team, or there's a disagreement within my family, and I know it's there, I just don't want to. I just don't want to go there. Maybe it'll just work out. I hope it does. I don't want to deal with it. Do we have to talk about it? I don't want to face it. Ugh, it's gross. I don't want to pick up the phone and make that phone call. I don't want to send that email. I don't want to send that text. I don't want to have a conversation. It's natural to avoid it because it's very, very uncomfortable. And here's the thing to remember. Nine, nine times out of 100, human beings will embrace happy to avoid discomfort. We will, I mean, we will, sorry, I totally messed that up. We will embrace unhappy in order to avoid uncomfortable. We will choose unhappy over uncomfortable. Nine, nine times out of 100. We will choose the misery that we're currently in rather than choose to bravely face the unknown that might happen by willingly engaging in open discussion, by willingly having a confrontation, by willingly calling out somebody's behavior, by, by willingly <clears throat> apologizing for your behavior. All these things that are finally, when we finally <laughs> agree, if this is what we need to do, <laughs> excuse me, then it's amazing how much life gets better, but not right away. That's the thing. We That acute period of discomfort is so painful, and we've had so many ways where it's gone badly, and we can we can predict or we can forecast or we can we, uh, how it's going to go badly that, well, it's just easier to stay in this misery. At least I know the misery. It's a crappy way to live. And it's a terrible way to lead. We'll do it. But that's the first set. And that's why it's the first of the seven deadly sins. It is the one thing that keeps us from actually recognizing and even employing conflict to our benefit. So let's say you don't avoid it. Let's say you actually willingly embrace it or you have to face it. You have to face it because it's just become unavoidable. It's obvious to everyone. We've got to have a difficult conversation. You've got to address your spouse and the credit card bill. You have to talk to your kids about uh, their uh, schoolwork. You have to uh, talk to your, your team about the sabotaging efforts that are going on um, behind the scenes for implementing the new software that everybody's got to implement even though nobody likes it. You gotta have difficult conversations with an employee's behavior is unacceptable. We have to do these things. 
if we're going to lead and live with influence. So let's say you do. You're well not going to face it. What's the second deadly sin? Second deadly sin of conflict is any form of emotional reactivity. Now, this is not, you're going to see some advice out there, conflict negotiators, mediators, who talk about, you know, leave your emotions out of it completely. That is impossible. We are emotional beings. Emotions drive our behavior. Emotions are what actually, in many ways, make us human beings. There's no avoiding it. And the emotions is, I, I'd say, that's one of the reasons why we willingly engage in conflict is because we do want some resolution. We want some relief from the pain that we're in. We want some hope that things can get better. We want to experience the joy of accomplishing something. And the thing that's standing in our way, the obstacle, is this conflict. The problem comes not through the emotions. The problem comes when we when we <clears throat> either ignore the emotions and give them too much power that way, or we escalate the emotions and we get reactive to them and we get reactive to the other person. This is so easy to do. And yet here's the power of emotional reactivity. It doesn't just make things worse. It actually creates the very outcomes we were hoping to avoid in the first place. That's the power of reactivity. I was afraid she was going to react this way. Right. And, and look, she did. Well, that's because you yelled. And she could sense it on you. You went in with that fear. You were bracing. She could sense it on it. Then you escalated the one time in this conversation where she didn't say the thing perfectly and you got all riled up. And then she just uh, blew off the handle too. But you're the one that did it by yelling in the first place. Reigning in our emotions. This is the entirely so much of what this show is about, the leader's pause. But learning to rein in and, and recognize this is what I'm feeling. This is what I want to lead with. The feeling is, feelings are there to inform, but not there to direct. And but that shift is the shift of maturity in so many ways. All right, right before the break, third, and we'll do the last four after the break. The third is triangulation. And this is far more common than any of us realize, but it is the usually the most common way people deal with conflict. First of all, it's the way people avoid conflict. You and I have a conflict between us that needs to get, but I don't address it with you. I talk about it with Sally, our coworker, and see if she shares the same complaint about you that I have with you. And if she does, then, ooh, I've got somebody on my side. So now I feel stronger to face this conflict with you because I know I've got Sally on my side and maybe we can get somebody else on our side. And then, you know what? I'm going to face the conflict with an army, not just myself. And then we're shocked when it doesn't go well. I'm going to talk about why triangulation doesn't go well. When we come back from the break, you are uh, listening or watching the Leader's Pause with Hal Runkle, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Leader's Pause. I'm your host, Hal Runkle, and uh, we are discussing the magic and the madness of conflict that we all face all the time. And the when we do our best is when we learn to embrace it and recognize that it is not just a necessary evil, it's a necessary good. It is how anything grows. Conflict between seeds and soil is what leads to magic of plants. What conflict between ions is what creates electricity. Conflict between muscles and weight is what builds strength. Conflict between human beings is what builds relationship. We should be teaching conflict resolution skills uh, in in uh, elementary school, we should be, t because it is the thing that we're going to face all the time. But instead, what we're taught is to usually avoid it. And that's what's usually modeled for us. And we finally get to it because we've been avoiding it. It's built up to much bigger than it was. And then it's an explosion thing. And then we have, that's why I shouldn't have done this conflict. That's why we hate conflict is because it escalated to that thing. Well, it's because we didn't handle it well. So the first three deadly sins, well, one is avoiding it. Seven deadly sins of conflict management. First is avoiding it. Second is getting emotional and emotionally reactive to it or within it. So easy to do. And yet this is what leads it to become far more uncomfortable than it needs to be. Three is, uh, is triangulation. 
and that is bringing in a third party to complain about the other person, get these, this person on our side, the third party on our side, and then we're shocked when the other person doesn't respond well, doesn't react well, when they feel ganged up on. And we need this social proofing of our side in order to go forward with it, and so we need to think we need an army of people who agree with us. And what this actually shows is you don't actually believe in your convictions enough if you are needing to rope in somebody else. Now, the only way triangulation actually can work is if the person you're bringing in is a, an amazingly mature, objective third party who has equal ties to you and the other person. I am a trained uh, certified mediator. I perform this. I've worked with a lot of conflicts over the years and helping people reach resolution. So I am a third party in that. That's not exactly triangulation. Triangulation is when we do it and we don't want the person to be objective. We want the person to appear objective, but we really want them on our side, which means we're approaching this conflict in the way of the fourth deadly sin. And the fourth deadly sin is any form of winning. Now, it's frightening how much winning has become part of our regular culture. That everything's about winning. We need to get a win. We talk about it in work all the time. We really need to get a win. We really need to win this year. We need to win uh, the quarter. We need to win. And I'm always like, win what? We need to win an argument. We need to win uh, a, a bid, we okay, we need to win, win, win. And it's just not as helpful nearly as we think it is, especially when we're engaged in conflict. The people who constantly want to win are playing a game that is actually infinite, but they think it's finite. There's a great book by Simon Sinek called The Infinite Game, and it's based on, on some uh, social theories that are really, really good that came out decades ago. And it's basically saying, look, finite games in the world don't really exist. A finite game is you and I have a season of this conflict, and one of us is going to emerge at a certain point in time, a clear, definitive winner of that, and it's over. That's a finite game. Does that sound like sports? Yes. And that's why we invent sports, is because it gives us this illusion that there are finite games, and it comes out of warfare, that there's a finite battlefield and there's going to be a clear victor. Okay? But when we think we're playing a finite game, but we're actually playing an infinite game, that's when we get into trouble, because we start, start looking for, we're basically, we're not aware of false finish lines. There is no season of end that ends in business where there's a winner. And then you start over. The goal of business is to stay in business. There's all, and so the, the idea that you're going to win one quarter, then what? You're still going. The season's still going. You still, and it never, ever ends. Winning an argument. What does that do? Especially when you're winning an argument over someone you're close with. Here's the problem with winning. Victory creates victors and victims and victims will eventually get resentful and they will undo whatever agreements you make with them somehow some way they will act it out they will come back they will renege on the deal they will not do what they said they would they will not actually honor the agreement that you got because you made them feel like a loser and why would you want to do that especially if this is somebody you have to actually continue to have a relationship with. I'm going to win this. And then what? And when we have that winning mentality, it is a win-lose. I'm going to win, you're going to lose. That's my job, so I need to hire somebody to win. It's like in divorce. We, uh, I, one of the things I've done a lot is mediate divorces and help people divorce really, really well. You're going to win. You're going to win what? And then what are you going to tell your kids because you had victory over their mother? You had victory over their father. What does that even mean? And lawyers who are preaching that, we're going to win this. What does that even mean? So 
are there cases with finites? Yes, there are cases. There are trial cases. There are civil cases that do have finite, clear endings. These are not relationships you're going to go on with, usually. But even then, if you're wanting a deal that's going to last, then you're going to want a deal that helps the other person find a way to willingly agree to this. And you don't want... Think about it. Take into court is the ultimate form of triangulation. I want to get this guy on my side to beat up this other guy so I can win. But that always creates losers. And the vast majority of conflicts are not in that finite way. They are infinite stuff with people relationship to relationships that have to continue. And so winning is a fool's game. What we want is a deal. What we want is a arrangement that everyone actually is going to stick by an arrangement that everyone actually feels as good as possible. That's what we're striving for. Call it a win-win if you want. I just don't like the term winning, but win-win, sure. It's paradoxical, but that's not what we do when we're winning. She's searching for a win. We're to win-lose. So what's the other one? Next deadly sin is accommodating, appeasing. This is the opposite of winning. This is a lose win. This is Neville Chamberlain in mid 1930s trying to deal with Hitler and trying to appease him. Okay, we'll give you Czechoslovakia, but don't take Poland. Guess what? He took Poland. Okay, we give you Poland, but don't take Belgium or Holland. Guess what? He took Belgium and Holland. Don't take France. Okay, he took France. That's appeasement. Appeasement doesn't work, ever. It's a lose-win, and you're somehow coming away thinking you've won because you've placated somebody. This is what you do with somebody who's a hyper-aggressor, and you're trying to calm them down and buy yourself some measure of peace just to deal with it. And here's how you know it. You know you're appeasing when you feel this sigh Okay, fine. Whatever. It's passive aggression at its highest. I'm going to willingly lose in order to try to win. That's appeasement. But it's still playing the winning game. It's still creating a loser and a winner. You're just voluntarily becoming the loser because you don't want to fight anymore. Doesn't work. Because there is still fight in you and it will come up later. And by the way... If you think by appeasing this person's going to be happy, they're not, because now they just had a victory over somebody they now do not respect. And that victory feels hollow, and they will not honor it. And they will continue to take advantage of you because you've told them that they can. What's the final one? The final one is um, what a lot of people think is the goal of all conflict, and that's why I've left it for last. A lot of people think the goal of all conflict is the magic word compromise. We need to reach a compromise. So if winning was win-lose and appeasing is lose-win, what's a compromise? Lose-lose. Compromise says, I will give up all of this as long as I know you're giving up all of that. So I'll lose this as long as you're losing that. And then we'll have an agreement based on losses. Now, the reality is in order to get some form of deal done, whether it's a negotiated deal or <clears throat> some form of here's how we're going to conduct ourselves from now on, if it's based on a feeling that I have to give up a ton in order to get this due, we will eventually resent it. This is why compromise doesn't work in politics. It's, it's, we've got to find ways that people are getting something, each getting something, not each losing so much, but at least I'm losing equally to the other person. That's the problem with compromise. Think about it. What do we say about compromising your integrity? Don't. So why do we say compromise is somehow a good word in another context? It's not. It's basically saying I'm willingly losing. And I need you to willingly lose as well. So neither one of us is happy with this deal. How do we expect that deal, that arrangement, to last? It won't. So what do we do? We negotiate. 
that's what we're going to talk about next time on the show. And we're going to look at <clears throat> what does it look like to willingly engage in a negotiation where we want the best for all parties involved, including ourselves. What does it look like? What is the what are the painstaking, difficult steps we need to willingly take in order to make sure that everybody is getting what they crave most out of this? It takes creativity, it takes discipline, it takes diligence, and yet it is amazing how it works. And it works all the time. So come back in a couple of weeks and we will talk about how to make conflict work for you. This is the Leader's Pause. You can always reach out to me, hal at halrunkle.com. Um, any questions and comments? Um, and I will be back in a couple of weeks. Talk to you soon. You have been listening to the Leader's Pause with Hal Runkle, the show that helps leaders like you find calm, get clear, and level up. Tune in every first and third Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on Transformation Talk Radio to access your greatest superpower, the ability to pause, think, and decide for yourself. Book a conversation with Hal today. Visit halrunkle.com.